it looked like somebody was bent over and had their head in the window of the deer blind it either heard me or smelt me and he pulled his head out of the tent and stood straight up and that that shocked me they don't make people that that big the way it moved uh, almost as if it was gliding across the beach I've never seen anything move like that in my life. They were screaming at each other in gibberish. It sounded like a language and they were chuntering away back and forwards, back and forwards, back and forwards. I know what a bear looks like and there is no way on this planet that what I saw were bears. Hi, this is Carol King from Music City, and you're listening to Sasquatch Chronicles. Sometimes it's the journey that teaches you a lot about your destination. Welcome to the show, everyone. Thanks for being here tonight. Got a great show planned for you. Uh, We're going to be chatting with uh, Johnny tonight. And Johnny comes to us from Georgia. And all of this started for him about 12 years ago on this property he purchased. And I'll kind of let Johnny go into it, but there's a lot going on here. And he has a uh, very cool YouTube channel where he posts a lot of videos, he posts a lot of uh, his audio. It's called the Sasquatch Encounter Brigade, and I'll include a link, so if you get a chance to go subscribe and check out his work. He posts some pretty cool stuff. I threw up a uh, thermal video that he posted, and fascinating stuff. I'll even try and play a little bit of some of the sounds he's captured tonight. Uh, there's so much to get to in such a limited time. It's kind of hard to tell, uh, you know, a 12-year story in, in an hour. Uh, but I asked Johnny if he'd come on and share it with us. If you've had an encounter and you'd like to be on the show, shoot me an email. My email address is wes at sasquatchchronicles.com. And if you get a chance to check out sasquatchchronicles.com, you can become a member and get additional shows. Uh, let's jump into it tonight. I want to welcome uh, Johnny to the show. Uh, Johnny, thanks for coming on. Yeah, Wes, I appreciate you having me on. If you would, how did all of this begin? I know uh, you're out there in Georgia and it started around your property, but uh, just start from the very beginning. How did this journey begin for you? Uh, Initially, I moved to where I live now in uh, 2011, and I live about a, I don't know, about an hour away from Atlanta. I live closer to the Alabama border than I do Atlanta. And I'm kind of in an area that's semi-rural. You know, I'm, uh, I don't know, it's kind of hometown America type, small town. But you go one way and you get into Atlanta, you go the other way and you're just, just hitting more trees. So I'm like right there on that level. My driveway is probably, it's close to a half a mile long. And I've got two other neighbors, and both of them are kind of in front of me and to the right, but they're up closer to the main road. And then behind me is, uh, I don't know exactly who owns it. I believe it's like the uh, a timber company or somebody like that, but it's just a lot of wooded area. And then that runs into like a 50,000 acre wildlife management area. So I'm right on the border of all that stuff. When we moved out there in 2011, I didn't, I didn't know anything about these creatures. I didn't know they existed. 
I really had no interest in stuff like that. Like UFOs was really the only thing that I even thought maybe could be real when it came to, you know, crazy topics like this. But uh, I had no interest in it. But 2012, my wife and I actually had a very, very strange experience with an orb. Basically, me and my wife had this interaction with an orb over the period of like a week. Saw it a couple different times. Both of us did. Now, at the time, I thought it was like possibly UFO stuff. I didn't know. I didn't know anything about it. Later on, I came to the conclusion that it was probably more of a spiritual thing. It was life changing. It basically changed the entire direction of my life, the entire direction of my marriage, all kinds of stuff. But uh, we were having what was about to be the last fight of our life in my head. We were... uh, We'd already had some problems before we had gotten separated. We got back together, tried working things out, and we were just having an absolutely horrible argument. Uh, In my head, that was the last argument we were going to have. I told her I was leaving the next day. Uh, We got done arguing. The kids, it was summertime. The kids were already in bed. Thank God they missed all the argument. My wife actually went back to the bedroom. She laid down in bed, and she was reading the Bible. We are Christian. At this point in life, I was, you know, I was questioning my faith in general. Uh, Things weren't really going good. We'll just put it that way. So she goes, gets in bed. I go to Subway and get a Subway sandwich. I come home, I eat the sandwich. I start getting this, this vision in my head of me laying out on this rock I've got in my front yard. And I could just see it as clear as day. And I'm like, what kind of... What kind of hippie crap is this? Why why do I feel like I want to go lay on a rock in my front yard? But I did it. I grabbed a pillow off the couch. I went outside. I've got this uh, huge rock that sticks up a little bit in my front yard. It's probably about 25, 30 feet long. I went and laid down on that rock. And my house is to my left. I'm laying parallel with my house. And uh, I'm a smoker. I'm laying there smoking a cigarette, looking up at the sky. I get done and I go to turn to my left to get up. And this big ball of light comes out of the woods. It's about the size of probably about a, I don't know, between a soccer ball and a volleyball. It's reddish orange. And it's, I don't know, it's probably going around 15 miles an hour. And it I see it fly for, I don't know, maybe 60, 80 feet. But in the back, the back of my house is two stories. And it flew right behind my house at the roof line where the gutter is. So I get up and I run to the other side of my house to see if it's going to come out the other side. Well, it doesn't. Now, the first thing I think is UFO. You know, I've never seen anything like this. So I run inside. I check on my kids. Don't see anything. And begrudgingly I go in there to my wife and I'm like, look, I know we're in the middle of a fight here, but I just saw this big ball of light outside. She's like, what do you mean? I'm like, it's just a big flying ball of light. I said, I have no idea what it was. And she said, well, you know, the only thing we can do is pray about it. And I did, I thought about, you know, I was in the Marine Corps for six years, infantry. And, uh, I'm sitting there thinking, well, what, what am I going to do with a ball of light? Am I going to shoot it? Am I going to fight it? I mean, there's nothing I can do. So I prayed. When I got done praying, it just kind of struck me that, you know what? Uh, this is my family. You know, I can't, they're my responsibility to protect whatever we got to do to get through this. We're going to have to, I can't leave. Well, I get done praying. I walk out, I go, I sit down in the living room turn the TV on and I hear, it sounds like something's on a roof. So I run outside. I've got a gun and a flashlight. By this time it's dark. When all this started, it was probably, I don't know, 20 minutes before sunset. So I go outside. I look around. I check the roof, the woods, everything. I don't see anything again. I go inside. I sit down on the couch. I'm there about five minutes and my wife screams my name, like blood curdling, like, Like there's an alligator in her bed or something. So I jump up, I run down the hallway. I get back to the bedroom and she's sitting up and she's got the covers pulled up to her face. And I said, what happened? 
She said, I saw it. I said, you saw what? She said, I saw the ball of light. And she said that uh, she got done reading. She turned the light off. She grabbed the cover. She went to lay back. And that ball of light, she said it was about the size of a pea. It was bright orange red. She said it was about as bright as the lit end of a cigarette at night. And it was only about two feet away from her. And she looked at it and she screamed and it went away and she turned the light on. So I went and got the kids, put them in bed, turned all the lights on the house, in the house on. I stayed up really late. I don't know, two, three o'clock in the morning. Nothing happened. Put the kids back in bed, turn all the lights off. I go back to my bedroom. I go to get in bed. I do the same thing she did. I grabbed my covers. I went to pull them up and over to my left. That same ball of light I saw outside was inside again, like she said it was, like she saw it, only about two or three feet away. I looked at it. I reached over and I slapped her and I said, hey, it's back. Well, uh, when I looked back, it was gone. Nothing else happened that night. Uh, I, th I think I went and got the kids again, put them in bed with us again, slept with the lights on, blah, blah, blah. Well, a couple of days went by, nothing happened. Probably about two or three days later, I kept noticing what looked like that same ball of light coming in and out of my uh, my chimney or my fireplace. Now, this is summertime, so it's not like I'm mistaking ambers or something like that or embers from a fire or something. But uh, but every time I turn to look at it, it's gone. So it's like I'm catching it at the corner, out of the corner of my eye. Just enough to where I'm like second guessing myself. Well, maybe this didn't happen and maybe I'm just think I see it. Well, by the end of the week, you know, my wife, she's still freaked out, but, uh, she works from home. Well, she asked me, she said, Hey, will you stand at the top of the stairs while I go get some stuff from the, from the basement? And I said, yeah, I'll, I'll do it. So I'm standing there at the top of the stairs. She goes down, she gets some envelopes or something. She's walking back up the stairs. She gets about halfway up and that same little orb, that same ball of light appears about a foot over her head. And it stays right above her head for about three steps and it rises with her just perfectly. I don't say a word to her because number one, I'm afraid if I tell her what's going on, she's going to freak out and fall down the stairs. Or number two, she's going to want to move out of the house because she doesn't like this stuff at all she doesn't like bigfoot <laughs> she doesn't like she doesn't like the orb stuff she doesn't really like any of it you know things she doesn't understand so i didn't say anything to her for about six months but uh i eventually wound up telling her what happened that night but that event when i realized it took me months to really really kind of put two and two together and to me i honestly think it was an intervention of some sorts, a uh, spiritual intervention. Because like I said, I was leaving that night or the next day. That was going in my head was going to be the last fight we ever had. And if that didn't happen, I mean, odds are I was going to leave the next day. So I kind of, it really changed how I looked at my life, how I looked at faith and how I looked at our world as in, all these things that we hear about that we ignore and disregard, some of them are real, you know? So it kind of opened me up a little bit. Since that day up until now, there's between my house and my neighbor's house, seven of us have seen orbs. Uh, personally, I've seen eight different orbs just around my, my property. I've seen them all the way out to about a mile away from my house. On the way home one night, there was a, there was a small cornfield across from this old guy's house. And I was coming home a mile away from the house and right on the left, there's that cornfield and there is a white orb floating on one side of the cornfield. So I start to slow down. There's nobody behind me. I work late. I was coming home late. And as I slow down, another one turns on and it is on the other side of the cornfield about the same height. Well, about that time, a car started coming up behind me, so I had to go. But the orb thing, I don't know if there is a connection between them and Sasquatch. 
it happens so often in the same areas. It's kind of hard to not think that. I personally try to keep them separated just because there's nothing. I can't really prove what an orb is or that it exists. I've got a picture of one that I'm pretty sure is an orb. But other than that, there's not much I can do about it. So I don't spend a lot of time focusing on it. But the more you get into researching this topic and everything, like you've talked about on your show several times, it's real easy to ignore these orbs. But then when they start coming together in the same areas as Sasquatch, it becomes unavoidable. I don't know what's going on there, but there's something going on. Yeah, I don't know what to make of those balls of light people are seeing. I've seen them. Uh, the only thing I'd compare it to, when you get close to them, it looks like uh, plasma, but they fly around, I guess, intelligently. Um, I, I wanted to ask you, the one that you saw, was there any sort of sound or noise coming from it? No, there's no sound at all. There's never been any sound. Uh, we've seen them. The afternoon that me, my wife, and both of my kids saw a blue one, uh, it was an hour before sunset. We got home summertime again. We got home from baseball practice. We get out of the truck, and I still, to this day, I can't remember, but one of my kids say, what is that like? I look over in the wood line, and there's a blue orb, and it's just sitting there. And I, I tell the kids, I'm like, hey, y'all, y'all go get inside. My wife takes them inside, and at this time, I still hadn't dealt with the Sasquatch stuff at all. It hadn't even come up yet. But I went and got my pistol, <laughs> like I'm going to do something to this ball of light. I walk out to where it was. It's gone, and I just fire two shots into the ground. You know, I, I didn't know what was going on. You know, I had no – that other orb experience is the only thing I'd ever had. I did not know what I was dealing with. But uh, there's never any sound. There's never – the only time I've ever had any kind of sound associated with these orbs is the one picture I got. Just like the Sasquatch activity, a lot of times it starts with one simple noise, like a bang on the back of my chicken coop, a piece of metal getting slapped, something like that. Just one noise. And usually my dogs go nuts. They run to wherever the noise came from, and then I go back there and check things out. Well, on one of these nights I was filming, uh, something hit the back of the chicken coop. I walk back down there to that side of my yard. I'm looking around, and I see a flash, this blue flash. And then later on, I went from the video, and it's just as clear as it can be. It's an orb. But uh, that's really the only time there's any been, ever been any kind of noise or physical stuff related to the orbs. Which is also odd because usually the sound stuff, you know, I associate with the Sasquatch. But uh, it's happened before when the orbs are around, too. What that means, I don't know. Yeah, I had something similar happen to me. Uh, it was on the Browns property. I've talked about the light many times that we saw out there, and we thought it was someone with a headlamp on. Uh, but shortly after the light went out, uh, Jonathan kind of has this old barn on his property. It's this old metal barn, and something hit that barn. I, I thought it was a huge rock that hit it, and I went out there, and there was nothing there. Uh, very strange. So you're seeing the orbs. At what point are you seeing the Sasquatch showing up? So we're, we're at about 2012, and then the orb stuff happened. The initial orb stuff happened then. Probably around 2016, 2017 is when all the Sasquatch activity started happening. And how that kicked off was I've got the other neighbors that are in front of me and to my right were kind of separated by a really small strip of, of woods. But there, the back of their property which is a large pine sapling bed is basically next to next to me, next to my side property. But they were having someone banging on the house, uh, throwing rocks and sticks at the windows. Uh, there's two teenagers, a boy and a girl. At that time, they were teenagers. The teenage boy and his grandfather were walking down the road one night, and he got hit with a rock. Just all this strange activity over and over again, it got to the point to where they were actually calling the sheriff's department. 
maybe once every two weeks. Now they had family that worked for the sheriff's department. So they had no qualms about, you know, calling up there and saying, Hey, it's happening again. And then they send somebody out, look around. I got involved, started, you know, trying to help look around, find out who's doing this stuff. I initially thought it was kids that it was either kids or the teenagers were lying about something, but then the adults were backing them up, but nobody could ever catch or see an actual individual. It went on over there for quite a long time and nothing happened at my house until one night my dogs went crazy. I went outside. I was walking up to my fence and there's this big pile of pallet wood that I was using for something. And I went to step up on the pallet wood to uh, shine my flashlight in the woods. And all of a sudden I heard a wood knock. Now at the time I didn't even know what a wood knock was. It was super loud. It was at the time it was very confusing. I couldn't figure how in the world a human being made that sound because it was, it was like one telephone pole hitting another telephone pole. And I'm like, what in the world is that? Now I think I'd probably watched, uh, enough finding Bigfoot or other stuff after this, like maybe looking into the orbs and stuff like that to where I eventually thought, well, you know, maybe that's, maybe that's what that was. Maybe that was a wood knock. Didn't really go down that road. But then shortly after that, I had another incident. It was at night. Dogs went crazy, ran out there with a flashlight, probably about 40 feet away from my, I've got a horse fence. It goes all the way around my property. I've got two acres. And about an acre of it is fenced in with my house on the inside. And there's woods on both sides and the back, the front, there's no woods that goes out to the driveway that goes to the, uh, goes to the road. So I walk up to my horse fence and there's a spot is cleared out. Now it's where my chicken coop is now. But before I cleared it out, there was a bunch of pine saplings, oak saplings, briars, all kinds of stuff in this area. About 40 feet away, maybe 50 feet away, I could hear footsteps. And it was obvious bipedal footsteps. It was crunch, crunch, crunch. Well, I would shine my flashlight over there and it would quit. It wouldn't move, but I couldn't see anything. I'd turn the flashlight back on again. Or no, I turned it off again. It would start walking again. Crunch, crunch, crunch. I turned the flashlight back on and it would stop. I probably did this about five times. And what was so confusing about it is I never, I couldn't see anything. It was so close that I thought I should have been able to see something or at least see like the trees or brush or something moving. Nothing moved. All I could do was hear the footsteps and it did that. It never got in a hurry and ran off. It never made any other noise. But every time I would turn my light off, it would just start walking again. And it did that until it was out of earshot. That was probably the first time to where I start thinking, this is something else. This isn't normal. Yeah, you hear that sort of thing a lot, mainly with uh, people being paced out, what they call being paced out by these creatures. They'll uh, be on a trail and these creatures will be off to the left or right. And people will say, I couldn't see what was pacing me out. There's all kinds of weird things that go on with these creatures. Uh, tell me about the time where you, where you saw the creatures and you were like, oh, that's what's going on here. All right. Um, I'll just skip through all the, all the little things. Probably the biggest aha moment is one of those nights. My neighbor, it started out with, uh, I hear gunshots. So I come running, I grab, I grab my gun. I go running out there. I go over to his house. I'm like, dude, what happened? He said it happened again. Somebody threw either a rock or a stick at the window. He, he gets an AR 15, comes outside, fires a couple shots into the ground. Well, by this time he's called the cops. So he's standing out there waiting on him. Now I've got an AR 15. I'm like, well, look, I'm not going to stand here holding this gun you know, while the cops pull up. So I'm going to go over here and I'm going to get in this wood line between our house. I'll just watch over you until they get here. And he's like, all right. So I went back to my house. I got on one knee. I'm in the wood line. I'm looking around. Don't see anything. He's standing there. He's got his arms crossed. And all of a sudden from the opposite wood line, a stick, I don't know, maybe it was about 18 inches long, about as big around as two of my thumbs together. It comes flying out of the woods and hits him right in the chest. 
from probably, I guess that wood line is probably 60 to 80 feet away from him at that time. And this stick end overhand beamed him right in the chest. Well, it scared the crap out of him. It hit him and he, he says a bunch of cuss words and starts running off. He, he falls going up the stairs, runs inside. That was the moment that really I was like, holy, like this really may be what's going on. These things may be real because I just couldn't imagine a human being standing over there in that wood line while he's armed after he just got done shooting and throwing a stick at him. So that's, I think that's kind of when my mind started changing, but it was, it was a year and a half of this, almost two years before I actually saw one. The last thing that happened that solidified everything was I had a, uh, I had a couple surgeries. I had to take some time off work Well, during my recovery. I was going and, and taking these walks around the back of my property. I had started learning about structures and all this stuff. And I started to find some of that stuff. I was finding uh, big, like five foot tall trees about as big around as a grapefruit stuck in the ground. I'd find like three of them in a row, about 10 feet apart, you know, a couple other little structures, stuff like that. Well, I kind of got impatient. So at night I started doing armed patrols. I'd get a gun and I'd go out in the woods and I'd walk around where these structures were just acting pretty much like Billy bad, Butt trying to get something to happen, but nothing ever happened when I was out there. Well, the next day I went out on that little patrol that night. The next day I'm outside. I build my, build my kids, uh, tree house. I get done. It's about an hour before dark. I go, I sit down on the porch. I'm sitting there drinking coffee or whatever. And on that same wood line where all this other stuff had been happening, there is a tree out there about as big around as my leg that just starts shaking, just like crazy. But I can't see the bottom 10 feet of this tree because it's downhill. So I jump up, I run out there, look down that hill, I don't see anything. Well, that night, I'm like, yeah, heck yeah, I'm going to do my little arm patrol here. So I get all my stuff together. By this time, I had bought a thermal, get everything together. I open my front door. My dogs head straight to that corner of the yard. And I'm like, all right, you know, it's rock and roll time. I'm about to find out who this is. So I go out there, go out of the gate. I get to the top of this trail that splits both properties. I start walking down and rocks start falling all around me. It's like somebody took a handful of rocks and just threw them up in the air but not one of them hit me. They were falling everywhere. So I backed up, I don't know, about 20 feet. And I stood there, I'm looking around my flashlight. And now I'm really like, wait a second. <laughs> this is, this is somebody or something with hands. So I start going down that trail again. And about the same spot where that big rock is, these, all the little rocks start hitting the ground all around me. Well, I start yelling. And I say, if you hit me with a rock, I'm going to shoot you. Nothing happens. I continue on down the trail. Got my flashlight out. I've got a pistol on me. I'm looking around. I'm looking through this uh, pine bed area. I get done. I go back to the top of the trail. And I'm standing there and I'm looking in my uh, neighbor's yard with the thermal and then from about 30 feet away from that same wood line where the rocks came from, that's the first time I got growled at. And it was, uh, you've got the recording I sent you of the, the second growl, but, uh, it sounded just like that, but from 30 feet away. And it scared me so bad that I didn't even, I mean, it, it, it had to jump on me. There was no way I knew if it got that close to me without making a sound, and if it was one of these things, if it wanted me, it could have, it could have had me that, that day is when I started to learn exactly how good these things are at hiding and at getting, if they want to get close to you, whether it's daytime or nighttime, they will get close to you. This, the one thing that I try to focus on in my own personal research is try to get people out of the habit of thinking about these things like they're, um, like a big lumbering walking upright gorilla like Patty. Patty was a, that was a fluke. 
And now that we know more about the story, I think she did that on purpose. Just walk like that, like she didn't have a care in the world. That is not how these creatures act most of the time. Usually they're behind something at all times. They can be 40 feet away in the wood line during the day, and you're not going to know it if they don't want you. I've had actually had that happen. But uh, that growl, that changed everything. Now, the my initial sighting is actually about the most boring sighting you'll ever hear in your life. About six months later, I was sitting on the front porch. <clears throat> I had spent all this money on thermals and parabolics and all this other stuff. And I'm sitting there on my front porch and my driveway comes at an angle kind of across my front yard. And there is a Sasquatch. It is full silhouette and it's backlit by my neighbor's house. It's winter time. There's no leaves on the trees and it is walking down my driveway, I see it sideways. Uh, it's r- whole right side, right profile. It takes about five or six steps. It's just walking across the driveway. And then it, I stand up to get a better look and it turns its upper half of its body towards me. So now I see a full body silhouette of it head on from the waist up. And it was massive. It was, uh, it was about, if I had to say it was about four feet wide, but it also had the thing that shocked me was the, my partner, you know, he makes fun of me all the time because it looked like he's got this massive, like 1980s wrestler hair. It's just huge looking hair is what it looked like. Real long and real poofy type. Now I probably see him for about eight seconds. The dogs didn't react at all. They had no, I've got three German shepherds. They had no idea it was there. When I stood up and it saw me, when it turned towards me, it it didn't act like it had a care in the world. It walked until it was out of sight, going back to that same pine thicket. I went out there later on the next day looking for tracks. I didn't find any tracks. But obviously that, I was pretty much sold on Sasquatch was real from that day forward. You know, I'd already had a, you know, all this other stuff happened. Well, that was it for me. I knew right then and there, these things were real, which was actually a relief because I'd been spending all this time and effort trying to at least prove it to myself. And then to actually see one, you know, I kind of felt vindicated, but I also pretty much dove in head first with research. I started a small Facebook group in Georgia just to find research partners. I wound up meeting a guy named Mike Taylor. He's a professional mountain climber, uh, adventure athlete. Him and I started going to North Georgia a couple of places. I wanted to see if I could find the same things in other spots as I was finding around my own property. So I found a partner, started doing that. About, I don't know, about a, six months into doing that, I was contacted by another veteran. Uh, we call him Captain Joe. He is... uh he was a captain in the Army Rangers, and he's, I mean, he's literally a war hero. He lost his leg saving three civilians in Iraq, but he contacted me. He was also located in Georgia, and he uh, he works for the Outdoor Channel. He works on a, uh, a TV show called The Pig Man. They go around and, you know, hunt different animals all over the world. But he contacted me and told me that he had a sighting on a military rifle range during a sniper competition that he set up and that's how he got interested well after talking to each other we kind of we brought in the uh, you know a couple other people we knew a couple other veterans we've got a uh, scott deforest he's a researcher he's a uh, prior service marine corps he's also a police officer for years uh angie williamson she's a uh, parole officer Another guy named Hank, he's a hunter. He hunts a lot. He's just got a general interest. Anyway, we all, we basically just formed a team, a research team. We were contacted by a gentleman. His name is Happy Harris. And he told us a story. Him and Captain Joe were from a, uh, pretty much from the same town outside of Augusta. Now, Happy told us this story that when he was, uh, I guess he was about 19 years old. He was on his buddy's property. The property is so old. It's been in this guy's family for so long. It's a King's grant. So before the U.S. was even a country, you know, this property has been in this guy's family. 
but he was out there hunting and he came up on this blind to him. It looked like a hunting blind. So he just sat down in it. Well, he hadn't been there for maybe 30 minutes and two of these creatures came up behind him. He could hear him talking with samurai chatter and it scared him so bad he passed out. Well, he said he wakes up 300 yards away, sitting back up in his truck with his door wide open. Now he won't say it, but we suspect he was carried back to his truck. So he tells us this story, tells us about the property. We're like, all right, well, this is something, you know, it may be worth checking out. So we go out to this property and the first two times we find the best evidence I've ever seen in my life. These big pine beds, they're perfect circles. It looks like somebody took their hands and raked all the pine straw on the ground into a big, perfect circle, like a big bed. We found two of those. We were finding uh, footprints. We found tracks probably 30 feet away from where he had his sighting or his incident over 20 years ago. So within the first day we got there, we verified that these creatures were still in the area. We found all kinds of uh, deer skulls. There's all kinds of wild pigs out there. Structure, you name it, it was out there. The very first night that we stayed out there, we actually had interactions at night. We had a rock thrown. It hit my vehicle. We recorded uh, vocals, like them grunting and all kinds of other stuff. We got that recorded. We had an episode where we showed all that stuff. And then, uh, you know, we were super happy about all that. We went out there again. Nothing happened. The third time we went out there, it was four of us. It was me, Captain Joe, Happy, and the guy I mentioned before, Scott DeForest. He's actually a BFRO investigator. We went out there, looked around during the afternoon. Unfortunately, Happy had to leave. Well, Scott stayed in the little camp area. It's a, uh, it's basically a pipeline, a gas pipeline. It goes as far as you can see. It's all clear. And on either side is, you know, pretty thick woods. Well, me and Captain Joe left Scott there, and him and I wanted to go check out the pine beds that we found before to see if they were still there. Because I think the second time we came out there, they actually looked like they'd been manicured. They were keeping up, keeping up with these beds. So we're out there. We're looking around. We get done. We think, all right, good to go. We'll head back. Joe's about, I don't know, probably about 60 feet behind me to my left. We can hear each other, but we can't see each other. We're walking back. I stop. I pick up a another uh, deer skull that I found. I'm looking at it. I drop it. I start walking. And to my, I just stop dead in my tracks, and I look to my right, and there is a Sasquatch standing right there in front of me. It's probably, it's less than 50 feet away. And it's plain as day. It's about as black as black gets the hair on it. If I wasn't out there looking for Sasquatch, I probably would have just walked right by it, even though it was right out in the open. That's how black this thing was. It looked like a walking shadow. But to me, it looked like a juvenile. It was, uh, it was crouched down at the waist a little bit. I could tell it was frowning. Its lips were actually curled down. I could see the bottom of his eyes, the bottom of his face. And when it got to his chin, it's got like a little white goatee. Well, because I stopped and looked at that, uh, the deer skull, I didn't have my phone out, but I did have my GoPro running on my backpack. So the only thing I could think of doing was to turn around real quick and try to get him on the GoPro. So that's what I did. I turned around and faced my back towards him. And at the same time, I reached in my pocket, grabbed my phone, turned it on and turned back around. Well, it was gone. And I found out later on from watching the video that I turned to my left to try to get the camera to come around on it. Well, I wasn't very lucky because it went to my left also. And I'm very curious to know what happens next. I want to ask you, Johnny, when you saw this thing, did it look more human-like or did it look more like an animal? No, it was definitely more animal-looking. I mean, it uh, the face was more chimpanzee kind of. The body is obviously humanoid, and the way it was standing was kind of, it looked like a human in a crouched position. But this thing was all, it looked more animal than anything, you know? I mean, kind of across, to me, it looked more like what people 
described down in Florida as a swamp ape. It's, it didn't look anywhere near like the more human or uh, Neanderthal or native looking that people talk about up north. Yeah, and I want to ask you more questions about your property, but I'm fascinated with this property you guys are investigating. So um, what kind of happens next? After I see it, and then I lose it, and I run over to Joe, and the one thing that has happened, one of the things I guess you can kind of consider it woo or whatever, is I have had problems with electronics. Like when I had a recorder out at this property before, everything I recorded out there with an audio recorder, I can't get to it again. It says file not available. But I've made recordings at my own house after that, and those are perfectly fine. So. After I saw it and gave this thing my back trying to record it with the GoPro, I didn't know if I called it or not. So I ran over to Joe and said, Hey man, turn the GoPro off. I want to, I don't want anything else on here. I don't want it messed up. Turn it off. So we get it turned off and we're talking about, it. I'm like, all right, man, we'll act like we didn't see it. And I'll walk over here and see if I can't see its tracks. He's like, okay. So I go the direction of where I saw it. Joe goes back the other way, back towards camp a little bit. So he's back behind me now. While I'm looking for tracks, I hear him yell, I see it. So I turn back around and go towards him. And I walk up and I'm like, what happened? Well, he saw it. Same thing I saw. But he saw it from the waist up behind this big, uh, it's like just a big dirt pile, probably from where they, they were cutting shooting lanes back there at one time. But he saw it from the waist up. And I'm like, all right, well, which way did it go? And he pointed, and it was the same trail that we had came in on that leads us right back to our camp. So uh, we're following behind it. We think it's gone, but I'm recording the whole time. We're looking around. We don't see anything. We stop. We're talking. And then all of a sudden we hear bang, crash, break. Well, it's obviously intentionally making noises. So we start going that way again, back up that trail. We stop and I actually find four fingerprints in the mud. They went down on all fours right there in the mud. I got pictures of the fingerprints. I put my fingers right next to it. It's as fresh as it could be. We're recording the whole time. We're walking behind, looking for it. We stop and talk again. Every time we stop and talk to each other, this thing makes noise. I don't know, 80 feet ahead of us in the woods. It's like we weren't following it quick enough, just breaking branches. Scott is back at the uh, campfire or where we where we camp. I call him on the phone. I said, hey, man, keep a lookout. We just saw one and we think we're following it and it's coming back towards camp. So we keep on walking. We hear a few more things. We're getting closer and closer. We don't see anything. Well, me and Joe step out in this clearing, which is the pipeline. And we start walking back to uh, to Scott, and he's yelling something at us. Oh, we can't hear him. He's too far away. We get up on him, and we start describing what happened. He said, guys, that thing came out on all fours into the pipeline, turned around, and walked back into the wood line. And right when it walked back in, you two popped out. And it was only about 15 yards away from him. And we didn't see it. So we're freaking out. He's freaking out. Now, Scott's seen him before, but this is the best sighting he's ever had. It was doing the spider crawl like you've heard of before or you talked about. And uh, we're talking about everything, blah, blah, blah. We've been there about 20 minutes. It's probably 20 minutes till the sun goes down. And I'll never understand it till this, till the day I die. I don't think it was the same one. It looked bigger. But a Sasquatch comes running out on all fours going across that pipeline all the way across until it hits the wood line. It doesn't go directly into the wood line. It turns right, and now it's running away from us. And when it hits the creek, it takes a left. So all three of us are standing there watching this happen. So now in one day on this property, three of us have had two sightings. Now, the first one, I write that up, maybe a mistake. Maybe this guy didn't know we were there, and he walked up. But the second sighting, I do not 
none of us could figure it out because it did not have to do what it did. The creek that it went to, he could have stayed on his side of the woods, gone down the wood line, hit, got in the creek, stayed in the creek and crossed and got to that side. And we never would have known. He could have waited till dark. He could have gone the other direction, several hundred yards and crossed. We never would have known. For whatever reason, it ran across that field on all fours, just just as clear as could be. We were we were flabbergasted. We couldn't believe it. But uh, there is no question. These things exist. Now, the question you ask all the time, what are they? That's the next question. For me, it's nobody's going to convince me otherwise. They're they're 100 percent real. Yeah, they're very real, very real for sure. I want to ask you about your property, but this site that you're investigating, this property that you're on, um, is it the only time you guys had seen the creatures? It's the only time I've seen one during the daytime. Now, I uh, I had the, the nighttime sighting, which was a full body silhouette. But still, even after seeing that, I was like, there's still like that 1%, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe, maybe something else happened. Until you see one during the daytime, not standing behind something, for me, you know, it's perfectly reasonable for people to question, you know, because it just seems so far out there. But yeah, this was, in, investigating that property was the first time in person, all of us, we'd all had our own separate sightings, but nowhere near like this, nowhere near like, you know, 60 feet away, just standing there or seeing the other one go across the pipeline, you know, on all fours. We actually have video from whenever I was walking after I saw it and then Joe saw it and we are walking in that direction. I have got video and one very clear uh, screenshot of its face. At one time, that thing was only about 40 feet away to, away from us in the wood line down at the bottom of the trees we had no idea the only reason why i was even able to find it is because he had he had this obvious like cone shape he's got like a cow lick like this big huge cow lick definite conical head and his hair stuck out a lot in the front so when i was reviewing the video that's how i found him as i found that that cone head and then that white goatee He's only 40 feet away from us and we have no idea at one time, but I got him. I've got one really good screenshot. I've got him on video moving around, but it's not enough to tell. All right. That's, you're just going to have to trust me on, on that video, but the screenshot, it's 100% his face. It's exactly what we saw. And it looks like a, I don't know. He kind of looks like a, a cross between a chimpanzee and a baboon. Maybe. I don't know, but it's clear as day. Yeah, and for the audience, definitely check out uh, Johnny's YouTube channel, uh, the Sasquatch Encounter Brigade. I'll include a link, and um, he also has that as his name of his Facebook group. Uh, Johnny, you got some cool stuff that you're definitely posting. I know you had captured this growl. Hello. Did you hear that? Hello. And this was actually on your property. And as you look at it, your dog looks like it's in shock. It's not till you uh, say something to the dog that it reacts. Uh, it, there's definitely a growl in there. Tell me about this. Uh, it's pretty much the same thing that's happened over the years, over and over again. I got to where now I don't go on my own property. I don't go looking for them because it's kind of a, it's I kind of created like a fishbowl effect. You know, I've got a fence all the way around me and woods on three sides of me. They can get away at will. As soon as I go out of a gate or whatever, they see me coming. So I basically just wait for something to happen. Well, I had heard something and it wasn't super obvious, but it was just a sound and I was just guessing. So I go walking down to my driveway. My dog comes down there with me. 
I'm looking around. My dog goes to the opposite side of the property. She's sniffing around. She's not even 100% convinced anything's out there. Usually I go based on her reaction. But uh, she wasn't even sure at this time. So I say hello. And then right after I say hello, you hear the. (laughs) And then my dog goes absolutely nuts. I've had two other occasions where I've been growled at like that. And that was the night I had the rocks thrown at me. And another night when I got home from work and I went to step out of the truck and it growled. It scared me so much I had to call my wife and get her to bring a gun out to the porch. (laughs) I almost didn't get out of my vehicle. Yeah, I don't blame you, man. I mean, when they vocalize, especially a growl, you know, the recordings never do it justice as when you're standing there listening to it. Uh, But for the audience, again, uh, go check out Johnny's channel, uh, the Sasquatch Encounter Brigade. Uh, Very cool. I'll include a link. Go subscribe. Johnny, you're posting a lot of cool stuff. I would love to help you with the audio, kind of level things out. And uh, so because you are capturing some really cool stuff. Uh, what really caught my attention was this thermal that you captured. And again, I'll put it underneath this episode. It's a really cool thermal. And you can see as you're filming something, something throws a rock at you and you kind of lift your head up like, what the heck's going on? Tell me about this thermal because this was in your yard. The thermal I got, it's actually a really good thermal. It's a, uh, it's a Pulsar XQ50. And, you know, I started out like a lot of people do with a, uh, one of those TK scouts, but it just wasn't enough. And one of the first things I noticed on one of the nights I was having what I thought was an interaction with one of these things is uh, only its face was showing hot. So I kind of got to, and then there's another part in the video where it looks like it runs behind a tree. You see an arm, but it's all cold. So I started thinking, all right, instead of looking for, you know, just a big, huge, hot mass, maybe I need to start looking for faces because it's very possible that their hair is acting as an insulator. So that's what I started doing. And now what I do, I don't read every time something happens. I'm outside a lot because of all this. And now because I try to get evidence. But what I've started doing, I do not go and start looking around every time something happens or there's a break or whatever, because I don't want to. I want them to be able to get away with some stuff. I don't want to catch them every time because then I'm afraid they just won't come around. But that night, this is a couple of nights ago, my uh, wife and kids got home, went and got dinner and brought it home. Ate. I'm sitting there on the front porch. Like it's happened a couple other times. Something hits like right in the middle of my yard. Something hits the ground, but it's night. I can't see it. My dogs run straight to the fence. I call him back. I go in. I get my thermal. My wife comes out, and she's got to go to her vehicle to get something out of it. Now, this water, this object just hit the ground, so I'm like, eh, how about you take a flashlight with you? Because she was just using the phone. She's like, all right. So she gets a flashlight. She goes out to her vehicle. Well, the vehicle's parked right next to the side of the yard where I think the object came from. So I'm out there scanning for heat signatures and i hit there i get i think i believe three different hits there's like one to the right one in the middle and one to the left but they're behind stuff so i can't really see them very good but anyway i'm sitting there looking and something hits i don't know if it's a rock or a stick or what but something hits the the limb that's right in front of me and above me and it hits it and knocks the the leaves off the uh, branches and they fall. And I say, what in the heck? I look up, I start moving around and I find finally get a good shot of what I believe is one of their faces. And it's just, to me, it's pretty clear. You can tell, you can see the face It's pretty as clear as day. And then it's got the conical head. Like I said before, the, I think the hair is acting as an insulator. So you can see the shape of the head and the body, but it's in black, like it's cold. And it's just, I'm looking at it and it's looking at me. You can see in the video, it turns its head and looks, I believe to its left and uh, turns around and looks back at me. I pan over to my right to see if I can see any of the other heat signatures. 
I come back and it's gone. Now I still have a bunch of video to go through. There's a lot of heat signatures in there. I've not found anything that's conclusive yet. It looks like they're all pretty much behind stuff. But to me, that's exactly what it is, what it looks like it is in the video. To me, I believe that is a Sasquatch face in that video in thermal. Yeah, it's actually a really cool thermal video. And, uh, you know, normally when I look at these, I'm like, ah, I don't know, that could be pareidolia. I don't think you got pareidolia in this thermal. Um, so what kind of happens next? Do they leave for the night? I stood out there for quite a while and eventually they just all move out of sight all that so it's pretty thick in there and unless i have one video one thermal video from last year where i'm up i'm actually coyote hunting and i am up in a tree stand right behind my house and it's in the winter time and there's this big boulder and it's 70 75 yards in front of me i know it but i know that because i uh I got the distance on it. I shot it with a range finder. But there is a head that pops up over this boulder, and it's slightly gray. And the boulder is super white, white hot. Well, the gray goes down again. It comes back up, and it looks like a person or what I believe to be a Sasquatch. It leans over the top of this boulder like it hugs it. And then the colors flip-flop. It's obviously now it went from the boulder being the hottest thing in the picture to its body being the hottest thing in the picture. Plus, it was cold outside. So what I'm thinking, like I said, with the whole uh, the whole hair thing, that's that's just what I've been looking for. That's what I've been. Uh, it's very rare, even during the daytime, for them to not be behind something. From what I've seen, even at night, they keep something in between themselves and us at all times. Now, why they're coming up to my property at night and have been for years, I have no idea. I've got a chicken coop behind my house that's just got a little latch on it that you can reach in there and get the eggs if they wanted to. From what I've seen, they've never touched the eggs. My wife keeps a garden on the outside of the fence. From what we've seen, nothing's ever been taken from the garden. One thing I have noticed, though, is I do think, for whatever reason, they're entertained by my dogs. Because I've had four or five different times where they will just throw things in the yard. It'll bounce and slide right up to my dogs. Not like they're trying to hit them, but almost like they're trying to get their attention. So, I, you know, Wes, I don't know. I don't know what's going on out there. I don't know why. They're so interested in my property. At this point, it may simply be, be because they know I know. Do you think that they're there all the time, or do you think that they pass through certain times of the year? This time of the year, uh, every year, it definitely, like right after the beginning of hunting season. And that seems pretty obvious to me because of that management area behind my property. I think there's more activity, so they move closer to my property. That pine thicket area back there where I got growled at, I think at one time when my old neighbors moved out and before my new neighbors moved in, I think they were actually bedding in that pine thicket. And they may still be bedding back there because my new neighbor does not go back there. I actually had to call him the other day because I got a, uh, a decocking arrow, a brand new one, and I shot it and it hit the ground and it bounced and went about 100 feet. <laughs> it's a good thing nobody was standing out there. But it went out there on their property, and I called him, and I said, hey, man, uh, I got to go back in your woods and look for this arrow. He's like, yeah, don't worry about it. So I go back there, and there used to be, you know, like kind of a 10-foot circle bedding area. Well, I get back there, and I'm looking around, and now there's a huge, like, it's 25 feet across where there's no more trees in a big perfect circle, and it's all pine straw in that one area. So I don't know. Maybe they're still bet. Maybe they're maybe they've moved in right there. And Johnny, is that the neighbor you were talking about earlier that got hit in the chest with the uh, the big log that was thrown? Yeah, he well, it was. He's gone now. They moved out. And uh another couple's moved in. They're a young couple. I mean, we're cordial, we're nice. I don't know them very well, but they don't spend a lot of time outside. And I asked them that night, I'm like, look, man, uh, 
kind of weird, I know, but did you clear out that big circle back there in the woods? And he said, no, man, I don't ever go back there. I'm like, oh, okay. Just asking. Yeah, and I know it's a new neighbor now, but, you know, the old neighbor makes me wonder what was going on there that they were so aggressive with him. Um, because you really haven't had them come up and be aggressive to the house or really come up to the house. No, that's what was weird. I don't know if it's maybe because they, it might have simply been because they were bullying this, that one teenager. What, if I had to guess, what I think happened was, is he cleared out an area back there to put up a, a deer blind. And it was shortly after that is when all this activity started. So I don't know if it's because maybe all these years they've never been messed with. And then all of a sudden this teenager comes back there and starts cutting stuff down and putting the deer blind up. It seems to be right after that, a couple of years ago or years ago when it all started, that's when it started happening. And, you know, they, they were for a long, long time, they were the focus of all the activity, you know, to, to the point to where, it was pretty aggressive, you know, obviously the stick throwing, hitting him right in the chest when he when he just got done, you know, firing rounds with AR into the ground. Eight minutes later, 10 minutes later at max. So for whatever reason, they did not like maybe that one particular individual, but they've never been like that towards me. Now, I know they know that I'm on to them, but maybe that's entertaining to them. I don't know. I can only, a lot of the stuff, I can only guess what's going on, you know? Yeah, without a doubt. You know, and that's why I ask a lot of eyewitnesses, what what was kind of your impression as far as what was going on? I know the eyewitness doesn't know, you know, can't get inside the mind of the creature, but it's very helpful to kind of get the impression of the person who was there as far as what was actually going on. Um, I want to ask you, Johnny, and I ask everyone, there's no wrong answer because no one knows. Uh, you started out, you know, not really believing in these things to now all of these different experiences. And it kind of started with the lights. If someone were to ask you, what is Sasquatch? What would you say? From what I've seen, they are, they're 100% flesh and blood. They live, they eat, they make beds, they hunt. They leave tracks. What they are, I don't know. They're possibly, to me, what it looks like is somewhere along the way, possibly human beings split. If you look at us and you look at our world, we just don't fit, man. We're very frail. We've got to be covered up at all times. You know, we got to build houses, electricity, warmth. You know, we're constantly building. We're constantly using our brains to make life easier. It's a possibility that they just went the other direction. Maybe they didn't get as smart, but they've got better instincts and their body has adapted to living outside without all these things. Cause I don't believe like maybe in Alaska, you know, Nevada, uh, Colorado, big open places like that. Yes. I, I think it's a, a good possibility. They do build structures that they may stay in when it, you know, it's snowing, but I have not seen any evidence of them staying inside of structures and living in them in the South. Everything I've seen looks more like, uh, like markers or something. They're just perfectly adapted, you know, for the outdoors, but I don't, you throw in the, some of the weird paranormal things and man, I just don't know. I don't know what they are. I'm still, I'm still stuck on proving that they are, that they exist. And then if we can, if we can get all that locked in, then hopefully we can move on to the next step and find out, you know, what are they now? Yeah, I hear you. And that's definitely a fair answer. I wanted to ask you, are you guys still seeing the lights out at the property? No, it's, it's been both. It started out more of the lights. And then whenever the Sasquatch activity, you know, started ramping up, I saw less of the lights. Now we just had another, uh, Scott and Angie a couple months ago, they went and checked out a new, a new place down in South Georgia that night. The first thing they saw was an orb that crossed the road. And then shortly after that, they had Sasquatch activity. Scott got a little bit of it on, on the thermal. So there again, 
somehow, some way, they had a orb and a Sasquatch together in the same area within a few minutes of each other. Yeah, very strange. Sasquatch is strange. The lights are strange. Be be careful out there. Uh, I admire you, Johnny. You know, all before any of this happened to you, you thought all of this was nonsense, and you know, you went out looking for honest answers. I I really admire that very much, and. I really want to thank you for taking the time to come on and share what happened to you. Yeah, man, I appreciate you having me on.